In this lecture, we'll continue our discussion of wave optics. Uh, we'll talk about diffraction from circular um, apertures. We'll talk about some other applications of wave optics like interferometry and holography. And we'll kind of set the stage for what's coming in in the last chapter of this course on ray optics. So we'll discuss the regime where we can use a simpler model known as a ray model of light to study uh, light. And, and that's, that's very useful for studying things like mirrors and lenses, etc. cetera. Uh, last time, we spent quite a bit of time on single slit diffraction. Uh, we basically found a general equation for the intensity that you observe so let's say you have you have a screen here and you have a single slit if single slit so this is a view from the top and then we're gonna see a maximum at the center and then there are some minima and kind of the intensity goes down as you move away from uh, from that maximum so the the angles to the dark spots or dark fringes, let's call them theta. So this is theta one, and in general, we had theta p. Uh, so that's theta two. We found that that's given by a very simple expression in the limit of uh, large, large L. So that was just p lambda over A, where A is the width of the the slit. Our general expression for let's say the intensity at some distance y from the center was i is equal to i max which is the intensity at y equals zero times sine of an angle beta over two over beta over two the ratio of the sine of an angle to itself squared and um, that angle uh, thinking about the the phasers right if we just divide this um, this slit of width a into n tiny pieces of width a over n then each of them gives a consecutive phase phase difference of 2 pi over lambda times a over n uh, sine theta right if these waves move at an angle theta to reach uh, a point on the screen and um, so that's that's one of these and we had this phaser picture where n of these accumulate to give us beta so beta was just n times that which kills that factor of 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 1 over n so it's a sine theta so that's the angle that goes into this expression to give us the intensity everywhere and then of course how that relates to to the distance on the screen that's simple right y is l tangent theta so theta for example is the arc tangent of y over l okay so so the single slit diffraction is just one particular example. You have a narrow uh, rectangular slit of width A and it produces some diffraction pattern. So if I, you know, look at the three dimensional picture, let's say that's the slit here, right? And then you have some screen in, in some distance. Well, on the screen right in front of it, we're gonna see some white bright band and then some fringes next to it so the fringes will be stripes because everything has 
has this symmetry, right? So if this is really long, take the extreme case that it goes from minus infinity to infinity, then as you move along the string, there's no difference between different points. So, so the intensity we get should be independent of the distance along this vertical direction parallel to the slit. It's really a two-dimensional pattern that, that emerges. So basically, this, this intensity is, is some cross-section as you view from the top, but at every wherever you put that cross section you're going to see the same thing until you get close to the edges of this finite rectangular thing but that's not the regime we're thinking about really mathematically we're thinking about a very long uh, long slit so that means that we stay away from the edges for for a finite system in order for for these predictions to hold now we can have diffraction from any kind of opening, right? It, it can have different shapes, different sizes, and they all produce different uh, patterns. Again, different parts of the opening serve as, as new sources for, for waves, and then there are different distances traveled to different points on wherever you put your screen, and that gives rise to, to some interference patterns. So a simple case well, mathematically, it's not that simple. We won't be deriving the result. But a simple case is a circular aperture. And that's very common, let's say, in, in telescopes, in, in cameras, in, in speakers. So kind of waves going through some circular opening is a very common scenario. So it's, it's important to understand what's happening here. And, well, again, see, there's some symmetry, right? So there is no difference between this direction and that direction. So, so the, the intensity that we get on the screen, right? So let's say this point, the central point, I connected to some point on the screen here. And similarly, I'm going to get some bright region here. And the intensity should only depend on the distance from this point, not on the angle, because there is really no difference between different angles. So the, the aperture is symmetric. If you rotate it, you're going to get the same thing. So we're going to get these kind of circular rings. OK, so let's take a look at a simulation um, of these, these patterns that we will see. So here, let's say that's, that's our laser is shining light on this aperture that's circular and then light kind of diffracts as it goes through the aperture and there's some screen some distance here. And then we form some pattern. As I said, there's gonna be this bright region. So it's kind of similar, qualitatively similar to what you'd see from single slit diffraction. And then, again, remember for the single slit diffraction, the distances of, of the dark fringes, for example, was some multiple of lambda over A, right? So if we increase A, for example, uh, they should get closer together. Something similar happens here. As we increase the diameter, the pattern becomes more compact. These fringes get closer um, closer together. That's because as you increase the geometric distances right in your system, the path length differences, the delta Rs for a given point on on the screen kind of increase. Right. In in the case of the, the slit that had to do with let's say D sine theta or something like that. Um, and then once the path difference increases, you know, for for a given point, um, every time the path difference changes by lambda, you're going to get a new fringe, right? So you're going to fit kind of more of these fringes in the same same geometric distance. So it's really the ratio of 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 wavelength to geometric distance that determines the pattern. Um, and similarly, as I kind of make the aperture smaller, 
I'm going to increase these distances. Ultimately, if you bring the aperture size to zero, right, these fringes should get pushed to infinity and we're going to just see one kind of dim region in the middle. And of course, once you completely close it, then, then it's gone. And, um, and similarly, we can play with the wavelength. So in the same way that increasing a makes the fringes closer together and makes the pattern more compact. We said it's the ratio of lambda over a that matters. So, so uh, decreasing lambda should do the same thing, and that's increasing the frequency. So if I, um, yeah, if I decrease lambda, if I come closer to blue region, blue and violet, I should make the pattern more compact, and that's what's happening here. And if I go to red, you see uh, the pattern spreads out more. So that's that's the the circular aperture. And for the fun of it, we can play with more complex cases like a square aperture. Now the symmetry is not rotation under any angle, so we're not going to get circular fringes, but if you rotate by 90 degrees, you're going to go back to the same shape for your aperture. So we have this symmetric pattern that if you rotate the interference or, or the diffraction pattern, uh, we're going to get the same thing. And again, like increasing the wavelength makes the pattern spread out, decreasing makes it more compact. Similarly, Increasing the size in some direction, let's say, let's say I, I increase the size in this direction, it makes the pattern more um, more compact in, in that direction. We can, let me make that really, see this is kind of, if I make this really narrow, right, in one direction or as wide as I can in the other direction, it almost acts like, at least when you think about the middle, right, uh, this should correspond to a single slit diffraction pattern. And then we can have more complicated cases, right? We can play uh, with more complicated cases where you have both a square and a circle, uh, or you can have an array, you're going to get a much richer pattern. Uh, Or you can have an arbitrary shape. So this is like, it seems like a little human. Uh, so there's a hole in, in that shape. And you can see very rich patterns that, that emerge. So yeah, so in more advanced optics, of course, determining and predicting these patterns for arbitrary shape, shapes is uh, is an important kind of computational problem, which basically reduces to treating various points inside this aperture as, as sources and uh, thinking about um, thinking about the interference pattern you get from these different sources on, on your screen. What are the differences in, in the path traveled, path length traveled, and what are the phase differences, and how how different wavelets interfere. Okay, there's a result that uh, we're go I'm going to cite without proof, without deriving. And this is for the circular aperture. So the, the location of the first minimum, the first dark fringe. Remember for the, for the slit, it was lambda over a, the width. Here it's some numerical, dimensionless numerical coefficient. It's 1.22 times lambda over d, where d is the the, the diameter of your circular aperture. And then of course, the diameter or the, the width of the kind of this bright circular region in the middle becomes twice that, becomes 2y1, which is 2l tangent theta one. So looking at this picture, uh, yeah, so if that's like a cross section, right? So I pick some cross section like that. They're they're all the same, right? Anything going through the center because the pattern is symmetric will will give the same intensity pattern. So it's maximum at the center, and then the first dark fringe is at some angle theta one. 
which uh, we found to be 1.22. Well, we just stated it to be. It's a the result of a derivation that's a bit more advanced than the level of this course. Uh, so it's 1.22 lambda, the wavelength divided by d, the diameter. And then if you want to think about the width, which is the diameter of this central bright circle, from here to here, you have L, this distance, times tangent theta 1, and then W is twice, twice that length. So that's the only result uh, we're going to use uh, for the circular aperture. Now these results, basically where we see the, the first fringe and the dependence on wavelength and the geometric, characteristic geometric size of the aperture, um, actually allows us to think about when we can use a different model for light. So ray model of light is a very simple, so you have a source and basically the idea is that light travels along straight lines. So clearly that's not uh, what we see here, right? Light, you know, spreads out and fills space theoretically. So when can we think about this ray model? So let me just give a a preview for the ray model of light and basically what I'm going to discuss is that in the regime where the wavelength is much smaller than the characteristic sizes of apertures and objects, then we're not going to observe all these fringes and these intricate phenomena so we can treat light as, um, as something that travels along rays. So let's say you have a source here and let's say I have an opening in front of it and then I put some screen here. So ray model of light says, well, light just is emitted from the source along these rays that go in all directions. And then once this hits a barrier, it's either reflected or absorbed, it doesn't go through. And then this ray travels along straight line, hits that, hits the screen. So ray model predicts that you're going to get just one bright spot over here, right? Any ray that falls inside the aperture will hit, will reach the screen and any ray that hits the barrier will not reach the screen. So that's, uh, Theoretically, in the wave model of light, that's not that's not correct, right? We know that any point here serves as a source of light that sends light in all directions, so light kind of fills the space. But when is this correct? Well, it's correct when uh, when pretty much all of the intensity is inside, right? The first bright region. So if, if I go back to, to this, let's say we go back to, to this picture, there's one bright region. And if, you know, if all of those other fringes are quite thin uh, and you have a sharp, bright central region, then, then we can use this model. So let's say, consider a case where you have a very short wavelength. So let's say, sine of theta is lambda over a. Uh, in for for the first diffraction minimum for the first dark fringe. And this is uh, this is for some opening of size a. Now, if you know lambda is roughly around a is kind of a large, or lambda over A is a large number, if the sizes are comparable to the wavelength, well, we're going to get big angles. So light kind of fills the space as it goes through this aperture. But if lambda over A is very small, uh, 
light kind of spreads very slowly. It remains a well-defined beam, right? You shine this beam on this aperture. The spreading is, is quite slow. So in that regime, uh, we can use this simplified ray model, which allows us to, to study many problems without really thinking about phases and interference and fringes, etc. And the wavelength of light, of course, visible light is, is very short, sort of nanometers. So for big objects, you know, for a table, human beings, a mirror in your bathroom, uh, a lens you can hold in your hands, like eyeglasses, etc., uh, that's, that's a good approximation. The typical sizes are larger, are much larger than, than the wavelength. So in order to see these, these wave phenomena, we have to go to very small sizes of a fraction of a millimeter or something like that. So they become, uh, they're not too, too many orders of magnitude away from hundreds of nanometers. All right. So, so in the next chapter, of course, we'll extensively talk about the, the ray model of light. So this is just a preview of when, when we can expect to, to use this simplified model. All right. Now, let's uh, talk a little bit about interferometry. So there are these very useful devices for making precision measurements, and they're used in all branches of physics for different types of waves. It's a very, very important uh, technique in, in physics, and it also has a lot of engineering applications. So it's basically a device that uses interference of, of light or interference of waves in general to measure something measure, for example, the wavelength of light. We somehow had this, had a simple case of, let's say, even the double slit experiment, like if you're not too, too concerned about precision and accuracy, you can use, use a double slit interference pattern to estimate the, the wavelength of light. But that's not very accurate. You have the diffraction grating that's quite a bit more accurate. But if you want to be really precise, uh, people have come up with optical setups that, that allow us to perform really precise measurements. Okay. So there's going to be one example we discuss in this course known as the Michelson interferometer. So here's the setup. So let's... Um, let me go go back to the notes and draw this together. So this is an optical device that can allow us to measure the, the wavelength of light very accurately. So let's say we have a source. And then we shine the source, let's say, is outputting some light here. And then there is a component in this device known as a beam splitter. So what is a beam splitter? Very naively thinking about the simple case, imagine a mirror, right? The mirror reflects all the light. So if it were a mirror, you know, this light hits it and gets reflected, it kind of goes that way, right? But a beam splitter is like a kind of a partial mirror. So imagine you take a piece of glass and don't completely silver it. It's a partially silvered mirror that that's not completely reflective, it's partially transparent and partially reflective. So it kind of splits this, this incident wave from the source into two beams that go in different directions. So there is a reflected one that goes this way, 
and there is a transmitted one that goes that way just keeps going goes through this this beam splitter so from the point of view of this way those are uh that's the part of wave that interacted with the beam splitter as if the beam splitter is just some transparent piece of glass and the reflected one that's the wave that interacted with this as if that's that's a mirror okay so so then what we're going to do is we're going to put two mirrors so we're going to put one mirror over here let's call it m1 and we have a distance l1 from the beam splitter to this mirror and we're going to put another vertical mirror over here mirror 2 and that distance is l2 okay so let's draw this again so first i had light coming in from the source it hits the beam splitter and then it splits right there's part of it that just keeps going goes through like that and there's some part of that that beam that light that gets split gets reflected goes up like that then the one that's going up will hit mirror one the one that's going this way will hit mirror two so from the mirror this gets reflected oops um, this gets reflected um, comes back toward the beam splitter similarly the the red one gets reflected comes back to the beam splitter so this is one this is two again here this went through first and second got reflected now now see here i have two beams again approaching the beam splitter so now this one part of it goes through part of it gets reflected so let's focus on the part that gets reflected that comes down so part of it goes back toward the source but part of it gets reflected comes down this way for the red one this is approaching the beam splitter again part of it gets reflected goes this way part of it goes through so here i have the source it's a little bit complicated but definitely on this side we can put a detector you can put a screen and just look at it if you want that's probably what they did in the olden days now you can put like fancy electronic detectors detector and just measure the light intensity and think about the interference pattern so now the ingenious aspect of this experiment is that this mirror is on some is on a precision screw so you can move it back and forth so okay so let's think a little bit about what happens right when these two waves interfere so let's say this is the one from the source let's just call it zero right that's that's the wave coming from the source and it gets gets split let me just also change the color here because so we don't confuse the one so everyone we go through the beam splitter the two that split you know have a have a color change so i can make that maybe um, let me make this green and these are the ones we don't care about and i can make the other one orange or something like that so those two we don't care about so here basically we have 
blue coming in. And the part that got reflected, I kept the same color. The one that went through, I made it green. Here you have red coming in after one reflection. The part that goes through, I kept the same color. The part that got reflected, I, I made a different color. So so the two, so the colors really represent the two waves. That, so red and blue are the two waves that we want to think about, right? So from here you have this one is the same and when, what arrives here went through one two three in red from the other wave it went through the one two three path in blue all right so first what is the difference in the in in the distance traveled, right? So let's say R red minus R blue. Well, here they're, they're overlapping from the source that they travel the same distance. So the difference is that the red wave goes, goes here and comes back. The blue goes here and comes back. So if that distance is L1, this is 2L1, right, minus 2L2. Okay. Then we have to see if there are other sources of phase shifts. Well, we know reflections can give phase shifts, right? So when you, you're reflected from a medium that has a lower speed of propagation, which is the case when you're reflected from a mirror, there is, there is zero speed on the other side. All of it gets reflected. So... Um, yeah, so there, there's there's a phase shift of pi for each of these reflections. But see, this one, there is a reflection from a beam splitter. So the reflection from a beam splitter can can give a phase shift. Um, it's, it may not necessarily be exactly pi. Could depend on some details, but it gives some phase shift that depends on the beam splitter. I think in the ideal case, yeah, we can we can treat it to be pi. So. Here you have one reflection from the beam splitter, one reflection from that mirror, and then you go through. So there, there are two phase shifts of pi each. So let's say there is a phase shift of two pi. Similarly for the blue one, it goes through here. There's one reflection here. When it comes back, there's another reflection there. Again, it experiences two reflections before reaching the detector. So they undergo the same reflections. So that those, those phase shifts are going to be the same for both waves and it doesn't introduce a phase difference, right? So therefore we can write delta phi, the phase difference between these two, between the, the, the waves represented with red and blue, to be 2 pi over lambda times 2 L1 minus L2. So now, why is this useful? Well, this implies that if, you know, 2 L1 minus L2 is, um, is M plus a half times lambda, we have a phase shift of some, some integer multiple of 2 pi plus pi. So that's destructive interference. And if two L minus L one minus L two is m times lambda, some integer times times the wavelength, we have constructive. Now we can move mirror two by this adjustment screw. We can move it over distances that are of the order of millimeters, some long distances, right? And uh, we can do that very precisely. So because the distances are not that, that, lo that long, we can measure the distance traveled um, very accurately. And then as we move, of course, we're changing this delta r, right? We're changing L1 minus L2, and therefore we're changing 2L1 minus L2. 
and then we're gonna go through a bunch of dark spots and bright spots right so the detector here detects a whole bunch of let's say dark spots now that's very helpful because instead of like measuring one short distance between two consecutive peaks or something as, as it's done uh, in just uh, let's say diffraction grating here we can measure just the number like an integer of how many times right uh, how many times let's say we went through through destructive interference okay so suppose delta m <clears throat> how many integers we went through is the number of either destructive or constructive right they're, they're all shifted by m times lambda of let's say i don't know uh, bright spots right so as you move right so you look at the center of that detector you see it's turning dark it's turning bright it's turning dark it's turning bright and experimentally you just count how many times it's happening so let's say that's 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 how many times delta n times which is a change in in this integer and of course well n is if you divide by by lambda in both cases right we can write m is 2l or yeah you can I can change the sign it doesn't matter right so m can be negative so let's let me just write it as 2l1 minus l2 I just define my I assume l2 is the larger distance so I write it as 2l2 over lambda I just divide by by lambda and then plus some constant which depends on l1 and depends on whether it's destructive or constructive so that implies that if you know if you change l2 by some amount and m changes by some amount the constant of their proportional right because this cancels out you're just looking at the difference in two values of l2 so delta m becomes 2 over lambda delta l2 so that's a very good way to accurately measure the wavelength you can measure very accurately how much you moved your mirror that's delta l2 and you can just count how many times you went through let's say constructive interference so from here let's say we find an expression for lambda so lambda over 1 becomes 2l2 over delta m 2 delta l2 over delta m okay uh let's uh look at an example here so yeah so briefly uh let's just review review interferometry so it's um it's a device that uses interference to make precise measurements then there are many types of interferometers um so here we just looked at one type the michelson interferometer um And, and yeah, and the idea is that you have one wave, right? And you divide it using some, some sort of beam splitter and then you recombine them. So they, you allow them to go through different paths and then come back and get recombined and interfere. As, as we saw in this setup, right? So source reflected this mirror going through, source goes through the beam splitter gets reflected from somewhere else another mirror bounces back the beam splitter and gets recombined all right so that's the condition for um, constructive and destructive interference which we found and these are valid at the center of the beam so typically like 
the angles, you know, where the, the wave hits the beam splitter differ, and you're going to get some fringes. It's a bit more complicated than this, but if you look at the center, so typically one gets something like a diffraction pattern, like a circular bright spot in the middle and some fringes around it. So these, these expressions are for the perfect kind of horizontal and vertical uh, waves and uh, and they work for the, the center of, of this pattern. All right, so here's an example. Let's read it together and then pause the video, try to find the answer. Um, yeah, so we want to measure the wavelength of light emitted by by some atoms. Um, so then we move this mirror M2 until 10,000 new bright central spots have appeared. Okay. So, yeah, so probably at some point in history, maybe they counted 10,000 times. They had students maybe to do that. Uh, now, of course, there's a photo detector and there's a computer that, um, that does the counting. And then, uh, then, this experimentalist measures that the mirror has moved a distance of 3.164 millimeters. Okay, so what is the wavelength of the light? All right, hope you managed to find the solution. Uh, so again, it's basically a, a direct use of the formula we just derived, right? So every time L2 increases by lambda over two, we see a new bright spot as as we see here um, so every time um, delta l2 is lambda over 2 right it it adds 1 to m it changes m by 1 and then we just Plug it in, right? We have the distance travel. We know delta m is 10,000. So it's a pretty straightforward application of this formula here. Yeah, we just plug it in. So two times that distance divided by 10,000. And we find, we find the wavelength of light. And, you know, because you can go through many, many of these maxima, uh, and that's a robust thing that you measure. It's just just an integer number of how many times you went through peaks. And you can and this distance travel is not too tiny, so even if your precision is not too bad, like uh, you you can measure it measure it pretty accurately. So division by this division of this large number by large robust number allows you to to do a very good good job in determining the wavelength with good precision. Okay, so the last topic of this chapter and, and this lecture is holography. Uh, so it's, it's one of the really cool applications of wave optics. We won't be able to do much of the math, but I'll, I'll just mention briefly how how it works. So the idea is, again, it uses a beam splitter. So you have a laser, you shine it on, on a beam splitter, part of it gets reflected, it's like a nice plane wave that goes this way, and part of it goes through, it gets scattered off of an object, a three-dimensional object, and then that generates a very complex wave pattern. But that's really what you see, right? If you're looking at the object, what your eyes see and perceive um, are, are these waves coming from all the different points of the object. Now, then one puts a film here. And what the film records is the interference between this one, the, the reflected wave, and the the waves reflected from the object. So you see that, so they, they interfere again, they're going at every point on the film. There's a very complex pattern depending on the shape of this object. They're going to have all kinds of phase differences. They interfere and that interference 
pattern, like the intensity of, of the light reaching different points. And then, yeah, it's, you can also be kind of selective, be sensitive to, to frequency. So kind of do it for different, um, different frequencies. But anyway, so that, that interference pattern gets recorded on this film. And typically it looks like a, it looks a complicated thing. So this is a typic, this is an example. Um, just one part of it is, is blown up. And that's the pattern. It turns out information about like the three dimensional appearance of that object is stored. So we can read it back or play the, the hologram by again sending this reference beam so the the one that interfered if you send it to the pattern on on the film it gets diffracted in a way as if you know the result of the diffraction turns out to be the same waves that came from that object so it's as if, so if you have an observer now on the other side, as you're playing the hologram, as you're sh shining this laser on that field that was recorded in this particular way, uh, the result turns out to be um, as if, you know, you have that object, a three-dimensional object behind the film. It's kind of this diffraction of, of, of the reference laser beam. Um, reconstructs um, the original wave that was scattered from the object. So that's, that's an example, a really cool picture inside. And, and it's a, it's a three dimensional, uh, because you can move your head, you can like look at different places, like it's, it's generate, it's reconstructing the whole the whole scattered wave from the object. So you put your detector or you move your your eyes, you put it in different places, you're gonna see different portions of that wavefront. Okay, so I think that's all I wanted to discuss in, in this chapter. Uh, so let's uh, take a look at some summary slides. Yeah, we talked about diffraction, like the spreading of wave after it passes through an opening goes or goes around corners. Um, and then we talked about interference of light when two or more waves overlap, reach the same point um, in space. They can interfere either constructively or destructively. We talked about the, the wave model and to some extent, we previewed the ray model, which is which is an approximate regime in the limit of uh, kind of larger larger geometric distances relative to the wavelength. Um, so we'll we'll talk a lot more in in the next chapter about the ray model. It's it's just dedicated to to the ray model. Uh, we talked about single slit diffraction. So the simplest formula we found was for the width of the central region. We had this formula for the positions of, of the dark spots, dark fringes. Uh, we had the simpler version of this in the limit of a small, small angle approximation. And then basically sine of theta is approximated by theta. And then we, we, we also found the distances on the screen. So in general, that's going to be just L times tangent of theta. And in this limit, it's just L theta. So it simplifies. Uh, we mentioned the circular aperture. We just cited these formulas for the angle to the first dark fringe the, and the diameter of the central bright fringe. We, we started the chapter with the double slit experiment. Again, we found relationships, kind of the distances between fringes. That was a general pattern of, of interference that you get, kind of uniformly spaced, bright, 
and dark fringes. We talked about diffraction grating, which makes um, the same formula, but makes narrower and sharper bright fringes. Uh, we talked about interferometry. We described Michelson uh, interferometer and how it can be used to find the wavelength of light quite accurately by just counting uh, how many bright bright spots you go through as you move one of the mirrors. Um, yeah, so so that's a good place to stop. And uh, next time we get started on chapter 34 and we'll talk about the ray model and talk about mirrors and lenses, etc.